My father uh, occasionally got tickets to the NBA games, and my three brothers would excitedly throw on their favorite jerseys and start making their signs. Meanwhile, I'd beg God to perhaps prove his existence by maybe giving me the flu, a dental emergency, or at the very least, just striking me dead. A few minutes into the game, I'd pretend to go to the bathroom and find the Miss Pac-Man machine, the only arcade game in the arena. Eventually, running out of quarters, I'd saunter back to the seats where my family was screaming and cursing at the jumbotron. You suck! Throw the ball better! <laughs> I think my brothers are so stupid. These guys can't hear you. What are you doing? I'd ask what inning, quarter, or period it was and how many more were left. Maybe we should leave early to beat traffic. <laughs> my father, not taking his eyes off the game, would hand me a $20 bill, and I'd disappear to burn more time. People passed by in their oversized jerseys and novelty foam fingers, looking at the solitary figure playing video games by himself. I'd like to believe that a few other future homosexuals of America passed by, <laughs> lugging their coloring books, dolls, or homework, nodding in slow identification with me. All of us hoping against hope that maybe, just maybe, the score would be so lopsided that our own fathers would decide that it was okay to leave early and beat traffic home. <laughs> yeah. On weekends, my father and brother spent their time screaming at football while I quietly read, praying my father wouldn't get tickets to the Redskins game where I'd have to sit outside, shivering, hoping the wave wouldn't interrupt my latest volume of Encyclopedia Brown, Boy Detective. My family's love of sports was only matched by my equally powerful disinterest in them. These rites of male passage, which came so easily to my brothers, were strange and alien to me. It made me feel like something was wrong with me. I felt like an outsider in my family, but I was never given a choice. When I was six years old, my parents forced me to play in a soccer team because that's what boys did. I was in whatever defensive position could do the least harm. The other parents shouted encouraging athletic cheers at the sidelines. Go, Johnny, kick that ball. Make a goal, Mark. Sam, great headbutts. I'd be on the field, facing the wrong direction. <laughs> My parents pleading, Leo, please just put the book down. <laughs> I never understood why anyone would want to run around on a field seeing who was the best kicker or thrower. There were flowers to be picked. There was disorganized chaos to be had by spinning around in circles, <laughs> spending hours trying to throw a football in just the right place or to kick a ball in the goal. It was boring. <laughs> My childhood became a collection of athletic failures. I remember trying to catch pop flies with my dad and flinching with my hands over my head, shrieking any time the ball got near me. My dad also coached the basketball team at the community center where I was put on the team, and I hid in the bathroom during every practice. I'm not sure why no one ever called me out on it. I guess no one wanted to mention the elephant in the room of why the coach's son was cowering in a bathroom stall. At 12, in a fit of delusional optimism, I joined a football team with my friend Mark. I liked the image it projected. Once I put on the pads and the uniform, I just became a regular kid who enjoyed doing regular boy things. I felt macho. Well, as macho of a 12-year-old can be, like macho light. <laughs> At the first practice, I realized that football also meant running. And the other kids would hit each other with joy. Tackling is what they called it. I quit almost immediately. But my mother still used my team photo from my bar mitzvah signing board as if to say, there's nothing distinct about my child, but here is a thing he quit. <laughs> Finally, I reached those teenage years where my parents realized it was easier to just let me be. No one forced me to go to games anymore. I wasn't coerced against my objections to play any kind of sport. I relished the joy of not being constantly reminded what a failure at athletics I was. Then in my early 20s, a friend and I went to check out a running group that did urban scavenger hunt trails called the Hash House Harriers. 
It seemed goofy and non-competitive. At that point, I was not a runner. I still had nightmares from the presidential fitness challenge. <laughs> where boys raced around the track to see who was faster and who can do more push-ups or better sit-ups. I wheezed through my 10 plus minute miles, having no concept of what a mile felt like outside of it being endless. And who was this president to judge us on these stereotypical <laughs> male activities? Not my president, I demand a recount. I decided I liked this group slightly more than I hated running, and I kept going back. It was fun, and it didn't matter how well I did. And after a few times, I could jog a mile. Gradually, I worked up to the longer runs and the 5Ks, and you know where this is going, and then I ran a marathon. I immediately set world records at each race for everyone with the last name of Deckelbaum. <laughs> I moved into hiking and discovered backpacking through every possible mistake, including trying to save money on one trip by bringing raw lentils to eat. <laughs> then spending three days pooping them out whole, possibly destroying an ecosystem and poisoning bears. <laughs> I decided that this new version of myself was a triumph over my awkward childhood. I reasoned that since I conquered running and found other athletic activities I enjoyed, maybe I could gradually revisit team sports. I was a different person now, so I signed up for dodgeball in an adult rec league. <laughs> My team skewed heavily towards women, and one of the guys let me know, you gotta represent for the dudes. I nodded slowly, smiling stupidly, thinking, mm, that's a lot of pressure on me, bro. <laughs> you might not want to pin the entire hopes of the patriarchy on me. <laughs> when they say somebody throws like a girl, they don't actually mean you throw like a literal girl. They mean you throw like me. <laughs> it's just complicated by sexist rhetoric. I'd throw the ball as hard as I could, envisioning rocket after rocket that plowed down player after player. And I'd open my eyes only to watch it float down like a balloon, <laughs> gently landing in the outstretched hands of the girl who forgot her glasses at home. <laughs> I decided the solution was to play on gay intramural leagues. where I'd be on the same level as everyone else. Also, by becoming one of these jocks, I would attract similar gay bros, just like in my favorite movies. <laughs> Actual photo my parents took of me as a baby. <laughs> I began with football, where I assumed as a free agent, I'd be on a team where half the men couldn't catch or throw either. In the 25 years since I touched a football or even thought about it, I was convinced my skill had grown inside of me, like a baby. <laughs> Desirable jocks would be in awe of my innate athletic ability. I ended up on the best team where the first question was, what position do you play? Uh, not catching? <laughs> not throwing? Safety back? I spent my first football game deflecting every ball that came near me and allowing catches behind me, spraining my finger, and in general, being inept. My next two games, it rained sideways and I hit on the sidelines, just like I did during my father's coaching days. In my final game, I sat in my car while the rain passed and quit shortly after. It's one thing to fail at sports when you're surrounded by straight men as an excuse, but failing at athletics on an all-gay team was just <laughs> next level emasculating. <laughs> Next, I tried softball, where I took up the position of least harm again, catching. No matter how hard I practiced, I never hit the ball out of the infield and regularly let catches drop several feet behind me. One time, I caught the ball in my glove and thought, take that 12-year-old self. But I was still the worst player on the team. Honestly, I just wanted to date the sort of guy who would play softball, but I couldn't fathom any guy seeing me on the field and decided that he wanted to catch for me. I 
I switched to kickball, where I learned how to pitch and only dropped the ball one out of every three times, specifically in the playoffs ending our season. I quit when my team planned to focus on winning by recruiting better players. Then I started my own kickball team as a captain, consisting of mostly lesbians, who quickly dismissed my pathetic attempts at authority. <laughs> You're showing us the wrong way to kick. Susan and Jen, help our captain to learn how to catch. This lineup sucks. Jen should be in center field. Uh, I'll, I'll just go stand over here. I tried dodgeball again, thinking this would be the gay sport where it all came together. It turns out I've become even worse at it. One of the players asked me why I threw like that, and I said, because I'm gay, bad, I'm bad at sports. <laughs> Finally, I just stopped trying to reconcile these two sides of myself. I'm in my 40s. I'm never going to bond with people on the playing field, gay or straight. I like the things I like, and they're fun, and they're active, but they're just never going to be team sports. My father and I did have one night where we came together over football. A friend recommended me for a freelance project writing for the NFL website. This friend was also gay, a joke maybe, and told a hiring agency that I was a huge fan. Huge, I said. This is my dream gig. I love the NFL. I love football, like a toddler declaring his favorite flavor of ice cream. After I got off the phone, I called my father and said, how are you? How's mom? I need you to tell me about football. <laughs> he loved talking about the playoffs and his favorite players, and I took notes, coming up with a plan to bullshit my way through a paycheck. And for just one night, I was another one of the guys just talking sports with his dad. Give it up for Leon Deckelbaum.